Everybody remembers? Okay. You're supposed to look up things on George Armstrong Custer and the Battle of Bighorn. Raise your hand if you remember to do that. Raise your hand. Good job. Okay. Where's George Armstrong Custer? Where was he from? Where was he born? Anybody find that? Where was he born? New Rumley, Ohio, right? Was he involved in a war before the Indian Wars? Kendra, what war was that? The Civil War. You got it, the Civil War. Who found out information about George Custer in the Civil War? Anybody besides McKendra? Good job, McKendra. You nailed it. The fact of the matter is, in the Civil War, George Custer was a great, great cavalryman. Very courageous, very brave, known to charge at the front of his men. He, he would lead charges, and he almost, it almost seemed like, like bullets wouldn't hurt him, like bullets wouldn't touch him. In fact, he even got a nickname, or they even nicknamed it during the Civil War. You know what they called it? Custer's Luck. Because it, it seemed like he couldn't be touched. It seemed like bullets, for whatever reason, wouldn't touch him, like he couldn't be harmed. He'd ride into harm's way time and time and time again, yet he would come out of the battles unscathed. In fact, maybe his most important battle in the Civil War was also the Civil War's most important battle, the Battle of Gettysburg when on the third day of the battle, him and his Michigan Wolverines held off the famed cavalry commander Jeb Stewart's cavalry advances. Now we'll get to the Battle of Bighorn, the thing that you guys were to have researched. Where did the Battle of Little Bighorn take place? Raise your hand if you know the answer. Where did it take place, the Battle of Little Bighorn? Where did it take place? Cole? In eastern Montana. Good job, eastern Montana. Josh? Near the Little Bighorn River. Near the Little Bighorn River, thus the name, the Battle of Little Bighorn. Exactly right. Why, why did this battle take place? What was the reason that George Armstrong Custer was going to Montana? What were they hoping to do in this battle? What were they hoping to do? Because they didn't, ahead of time, they didn't say the battle's going to be at a place called Little Bighorn River, did they? No. That just happened to be where they met the Indians. Right? So what was the purpose of Custer and General Terry, who he was attached to, as well as General Crook, who was coming from the south, and General Gibbon, who was coming from the west, and they were hoping to catch the Indians in a trap, right? Custer and Terry came from the east. Custer left from Fort Abraham Lincoln. Crook came from the south and Gibbon from the west. And they were hoping to locate this large band of Indians and to defeat them in battle and or force them onto the reservation, right? So we get to this battle, this pivotal battle in the American West. Somebody have what dates it happened? What was the date of it? Kyle? May 25th and 26th, 1876. Good job, you nailed it. June 25th and 26th of 1876. You know what else happened in 1876? That was the 100 year celebration of America. That was the bicentennial of our country. Or the centennial, excuse me, of our country. What was the weather like that? Did anybody find out when you were, when you were looking up information on the battle? What, what was the weather like that day when the battle began? And in the days before it? It was hot. It was pure heat. Somewhere maybe even up to 100 degrees. It was very hot. Very difficult when you're wearing those heavy woolen uniforms of the cavalry and the horses, the, you know, having to go and pull the, the, the wagons and the ammunition and, and all these different things. 
Logan, how'd the battle begin? What did you have down? Custer had an army of 700 men. Custer originally was with a group of about 700 men. Okay. What else? Cole, what did you have? Cole Renner. When the Indians closed in, Custer ordered his men to shoot their horses and stack the carcasses to form a wall. Okay, so when the Indians closed in in the Custer part of the battle, they shot their horses and used them as breastworks to protect them from the Indian bullets and arrows. That happened in the battle. Josh Iverson. What you have there about the Battle of Bighorn? It ended in defeat for Custer. Okay, it was a defeat for Custer. Jordan? Kyle? Uh, I can have a during or after. During the battle. Anything you can give me about what happened in the battle, during the battle, before the battle, after the battle, any point of the battle? There were 268 deaths, including scouts, and there were 55 wounded. Okay, good information. Jordan, do you got any information that will help us out? That's what I heard. You had the same? Julie? Two of Preston's brothers were killed in the nephew of his and a brother-in-law. Okay, so Custer lost some of his family members, right? Besides he himself getting killed, two of his brothers. What were their names? Tom Custer and Boston Custer, a nephew, Audie Reed, all died in the battle. Cole Pudwell, you've got to give us some information yet about the battle of Bighorn. What do you got? The major Indian leaders were Crazy Horse Gall, which were both visions of Sitting Bull. Okay, so so two of the war leaders in the battle were Chief Gall and Crazy Horse, right? Now, did Sitting Bull actually fight in the battle? You're shaking your heads, no. Why do you say he didn't actually fight in the battle? Because he. Wasn't dead yet, no. Cole Renner? He was making the traps. Some people say he directed the battle from the village. Other people say he just simply offered up prayers and so on during the battle. He was an old man, you guys realize at this time. He was pretty old to still be fighting. So he did not participate in the actual fighting. He stayed in the village. He stayed in the village. Are you ready for me to break down the Battle of Little Bighorn for you? Okay. North of the Battle of Little Bighorn, Custer broke off from General Terry. Custer was actually under General Alfred Terry because he'd been punished for some things earlier. And he broke off from General Terry, and General Terry let him go, and General Terry, you know, basically gave him orders, leaving it up to Custer to decide when to attack, if to attack, if he found the Indians. He left it up to Custer. Some people say that Terry did joke to Custer, you know, now don't be greedy, Custer. Save some for us. I don't know if he did or not. There's speculation that he may have. But Custer broke off. Custer took with him his six to seven hundred men, and he rode to look for the Indians. Well, as he got to this point where this little bighorn is, his scouts started telling him that they found a village. And they said it's the biggest village they ever seen. Well, Custer knew that sometimes the scouts would exaggerate this and so on, his Indian scouts. And, 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 and they said, come to this bluff, come up to this lookout point, and you'll see for yourself. 
It's the biggest pony herd we ever see. And so Custer went up there and he looked through his glasses and he looked through his glasses. He just couldn't see it. He couldn't make it out. He said, I don't see anything. They said, it's there. It's one of the biggest villages we've ever seen. So Custer kept riding, kept pushing his men. Even though it was hot, even though the horses were lathered up, even though his men were tired. You know, you can go, oh, how can you be tired when you're riding on a horse? Even if you're not walking, just in the saddle all day in the heat, you can get tired, can't you? So the men are exhausted, the men are tired, yet Custer's going to push them. He's going to push them, he's going to push them, and he's going to push them. Because he's afraid that the Indians are going to discover he is there. And then that they're going to strike camp and they're going to leave and escape. That's Custer's biggest fear at this point. The size of the village means nothing to Custer. Because you've got to remember, we're talking about a man who's, who's got a huge ego. A man who's very cocky and very confident in his abilities. A man who, who to be honest, everything has always worked out for. He destroyed Black Kettle, the Cheyenne chief, in the Washita and earlier Indian Wars down in Kansas. In the Civil War, I already told you he lived a charmed life. So here's a man that's, that's really never known defeat. He kind of believes he's invincible to an extent. He believes the myth of Custer's luck. He believes it himself. And so all Custer can think about is, we've got to attack. We've got to attack before the Indians escape. And so he pushes his men. They get to a place where there's a teepee. And there's some dead Native Americans in there from a battle that they had with Crook just a week earlier or so. Now Custer's starting to get anxious. Custer's just chomping for a fight because Custer was a pistol. And there's nothing Custer liked better than a good fight. He loved it. You know how most men fear warfare? You know how most men, you know how the natural reaction of a human being is when somebody's shooting at you to do what? Run the other way, right? To run the other way. Or to, 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 to go in and duck and hide and get down. Custer was one of those rare individuals that loved the sound of gunfire. Ride to the sound of the guns. He'd charge into the teeth of it. You know, he had a big ego, and he was cocky, and he was overconfident, and, and he could be all these different things. He was a very complicated man. But you can't question his courage. He was a very courageous person. We know that. They got closer, and Custer's scouts were getting nervous because they said, this village is big. In fact, it was a big village. This village is literally going to stretch for miles. Can you imagine that many teepees? stretching for miles along the west side of the Little Bighorn. Unbelievable. And so the scouts are getting a little nervous. In fact, some of the scouts, he's actually going to release them from duty. He's, he's going to say, you've done your job, you can be released. Well, they think that the Indians spotted him. Custer was almost sure the Indians had spotted him. And so he quick wanted to go and fight before the Indians got away. Because, like I said, his biggest fear was they were going to escape. So Custer and his men get west, or excuse me, east and south of the battlefield. And at that point, Custer makes one of his first mistakes. He's facing a village that's extending miles along the Little Bighorn River. In that village, there may be as many as 2,000. Some people even say more, but maybe 1,500 to 2,000 to maybe even a few more warriors. Now, Custer at most has around 700 men, right? Logan, you gave us that information. So they're, they're actually, they're, they're for sure double and probably more Indians in this encampment, warriors, not Indians, and there's even more there when you count women and children, but Indian warriors, there's more in that camp. But 
Custer splits his forces. Conventional wisdom tells you, never split your forces in the face of a larger enemy, but Custer does it anyway. And so what Custer does, here's his plan. Custer is going to go and ride along these ridge of hills. He is going to go to the west and ride along these ridge of hills. Custer is going to send Major Reno down here to attack the south end of the village. So Major Marcus Reno is going to move down here to the south end of the village. So here's George Armstrong Custer. You all seen what he looks like from when you looked up the information online. Curly blonde hair, didn't he? He'd actually cut his hair before the battle. Major Marcus Reno, the man that I told you going to take up this position right here, that's Major Reno. Custer's going to trust this man to help spring his trap. And then the third group of soldiers, Custer is going to send a group under Captain Benteen further to the south. And he's going to give them kind of murky directions. He's just going to tell them, kind of search around down there and see what you find. It's not real, real specific instructions or directions or orders, is it? No. But that's what he's going to tell Ben T. This right here is Captain Ben T. Captain Ben T and Custer do not like each other. They big time do not like each other. They've had a rivalry. So here's Custer's plan. He is going to have Major Reno, he wants him to attack the south end of the village. Through these trees and attack the south end of the village. Custer's plan is to ride along these hills, find a place to cross the river, and then come down and grab and pitch the Indians in a trap. So he wants Reno to attack and push him to him who's going to be on the north end of the village. Reno is to attack the Indians and drive them north right into the waiting arms of George Armstrong Custer. Sound like a good plan? Could be, right? But for the plan to work, Reno has to be able to actually drive the Indians push them through the village. Custer has to be able to be there waiting for them, and they have to be able to get them in that trap. Plus, we still have that one big glaring problem. What's that big glaring problem, Dylan? They are standing behind them still from where he wants to come in. They what? They're still behind them. There's more of the village behind them from where he wants okay. to come Okay. Yeah, it's a very, very large village, and he may be able to get all, be able to get all the way to the north. That's true. Yes. Bingo! Win or win a chicken dinner, you're exactly right. They're still outnumbered tremendously. They're still outnumbered. Sometimes you can have the best plan in the world. But if you're big time outnumbered, there's sometimes nothing you can do. So it's debatable how good his plan was because he did split his forces in the face of a larger enemy. But it was a plan that maybe could have worked if it wasn't for the fact that there were so many Indian wars. Well, Custer sets the trap. Custer goes ahead and starts to ride here. At the last point that anybody that survives the battle, any white man that survives the battle, sees Custer alive is when Custer gets to this high point of the battlefield, which we call Weir Point. 
At that point, Custer can see the beginnings of the battle where Major Marcus Reno is attacking the Indian village. Okay? So the first part of the battle starts right here. Reno drives in through these trees and drives in to attack the south end of the village. Reno and his men actually get across the river. They get through the trees and they get to this stage of the battle right here where they're actually firing into the village. Now instead of continuing to charge, Reno's men are at this point and they're firing into the village. And they actually take the Indians by surprise right away. Actually, they take them by surprise and, 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 and they are, boom, boom, boom. There are some fall. They're catching them by surprise, okay? But it doesn't take long and the Indians regroup. And when they regroup, all hell is gonna break loose. The Indians are gonna come just flooding out of this village to attack Reno. And the fighting is going to be fierce. Reno at first orders his men to dismount. Fire and skirmish lines. And so his men are firing. I mean, his men, they're there and, and they're firing. Some are on their knees and they're firing into the village and they're firing into the village and they're firing into the village and they're firing into the village. They're, into the village. they're armed with trapdoor Springfield rifles. They're single shot rifles, people. Okay? Every time you fire, you flip open the trap door, you pull a cartridge out, you load the cartridge, you slam down the trap door, you cock the hammer, you fire another round. It's better than a muzzle loader of the old days, but it still isn't as fast as a repeating rifle. Now Marcus Reno himself, Major Reno, he has a lever action, kind of like this toy gun here. He's got a lever action, which obviously is much faster, isn't it? Okay, well there they are. By this time, Indians, like I said, they're starting just to flood out of the village. So they're coming, they're coming, and they're they're getting right up against her. They're starting to press at the lines of Major Marcus Reno. At this point, Reno gets nervous. And Reno gives the order to fall back. Fall back to the trees! Fight from the trees! Fall back to the trees! Why, why would you fall back to the trees? What's the purpose of going to the trees? Go! Cover. Bingo. Gives you cover. So Reno falls back to the trees. So now his men are fighting in the trees. They got a little bit of protection. They're not heavy trees, but they're a little bit of, they're a little bit of protection there and so on. So they're fighting from the trees. The Indians are continuing to press. And they're getting in closer, and they're getting in closer, and they're launching arrows, and the, the Indians themselves are armed with firearms in this battle. And so they're starting to press in closer. In some places, they've even got in amongst them a little bit. Now, Reno is starting to panic a little bit, because the Indians are starting to get around him a little bit. The Indians are pressing hard. He can tell there's a lot of them there, and there's more coming. Now, as the Indians would ride and charge toward them, what would they do that would make it even more terrifying for the soldiers? It, 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 it's it's kind of like the same thing that the Confederates did in the Civil War. You ever heard the rebel yell? Well, when, when the Confederate troops are going to charge the Union and they give their rebel yell, yeah! they give that rebel yell. Well, it, it's a terrifying thing. It, it's psychological warfare. Well, the Indians had the same kind of a deal. They had whistles they would blow on, and they would. Yeah! They would have a different war cry also, and, and it was very, it was psychologically very scary. If you're a soldier and you're trying to fight it, and they're they're charging down at you and they're blowing whistles and they're yeah 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 giving these war cries, and it, it was psychologically very difficult. So we know in the heat of this battle, Marcus Reno already is he, he he's psychologically it's difficult, and, and and he's giving the order to fall back to the trees and fight from the trees, and they're doing that. And then something happens which is going to completely change the course of this battle. At this point, Reno has failed to attack. So Custer's probably going to be in trouble. Reno is barely holding his men together. And then something happens. Reno is fighting. Now this isn't the, the same kind of hat that Major Marcus Reno had, but he had a, a hat, type of a cowboy looking hat, and he was wearing. 
and he was firing away. Firing away, and he's looking around, he's starting to panic. I mean, he's looking, and he's starting to see Indians everywhere. And then the Indian scout was right beside him. One of his allies, a crow scout, an Indian scout, was right beside him. And that Indian scout took a bullet to the skull, and it blew his head up. It just, boom! And brain tissue and blood flew all over Reno's face and his hat, and, and, and he, he's literally wiping brain tissue and blood out of his face. At that point, Reno totally panics. At that point, Major Marcus Reno loses it. We know that a commander has to be cool in battle, but at that point, Major Marcus Reno loses it. He's just had a man's brain splattered all over his face. And he just starts screaming, retreat, retreat, sound recall, sound recall. So, so the bugler is trying to, he's trying to give the, 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 the the, the, the bugle call a retreat, and he's shouting for men to retreat. The problem is, some men hear the order, some men don't. And Marcus Reno, he's, he gets out of there first, basically. So Reno goes and takes this route. By this time, Custer's over here, okay? When all this is going on, Custer has gotten down into this little valley and, and down here by what we call Medicine Tail Coulee. We'll talk about that in a second. So Custer's down at this point. Custer cannot have known what happened to Reno. Custer cannot see the fact that Reno is being routed. Do you understand what I'm saying? Had Custer been able to see that, he would have rode back, correct? But he does not see that. As far as Custer's concerned, Reno has maintained his attack on the village. As far as Custer knows, Reno has maintained his attack on the village. In fact, Custer can hear the firing. Reno, however, did not maintain his attack. And Reno retreated, and now Reno is in full retreat. And Reno is riding up. He's riding across this river, and you guys gotta realize, these are cliffs and bluffs here along the river. How those horses climbed that bluff, I don't know. Horses and men were, were going on pure adrenaline. So what you have now at this point is Indians are in and amongst the, these guys. It, it's gotten to the point where they're in and amongst them. They're following Reno up this hill. As many as can make it are going to the high ground because Reno's, you know, Reno's shouting, get to the high ground! Because you always have a better defensive position on the high ground. Does that make sense? So Reno and, and his men are getting to the high ground, the men that can make it. Unfortunately, you know what? A lot of these guys ain't going to make it. Dead. Dead. Wounded and dying. Dead. They're not going to make it. And, and as some of them are trying to cross this river, Indians are jumping and pulling them off their horses, clubbing them to death in the water. It's getting hand-to-hand -hand combat. It's ugly. Some of them are trying to hide in the grass along the little bighorn. It, it's just, it's an ugly, ugly scene. But Reno is routed. His men are dead. The survivors of Reno's outfit dig in on a hill that's forever going to be called Reno Hill. Reno at this point is unfit for command. Reno at this point is, is still freaking out. He's still got blood and brains all over his face. Reno is, he's, he's just, he's panicked, as you can imagine. Luckily for Reno, Captain Ben T, remember I told you Ben T? Benteen is going to come riding from the south and the east and is going to reinforce him. So Reno and Benteen are going to have around 400 men with them. Of course, that's not counting those that have already been killed and wounded and so on. 
Custer with him is going to have, Custer's going to have about what? Going to have around 200 men with him. Probably a little bit, probably a little bit less than 200 men with him. Right? Okay. So now we get to the Custer part of the battle. Custer, unaware that Rito's been routed. Custer looks for a place that he can cross the little big horn, and he finds it right here in Medicine Tail Coulee. So they get down here in the Medicine Tail Coulee. And at this point, we have the man that I consider to be the luckiest man on God's green earth. Private Martini. Custer knows it's a big village. At this point, Custer is looking down here, and Custer is going, whoa, we're going to need more ammunition. So Custer goes to his orderly, W.W. Cook, and says, hey, i got to send out a message to Ben Teen to bring more ammunition. So they call up a young Italian immigrant who's joined the, the, the U.S. Cavalry named Martini, Giovanni Martini. The English version of his name was John Martin, but his real name was Giovanni Martini. W.W. Cook quickly scrolled out a note. Big Village, bring packs. Come quickly. P.S. Bring packs. You know what packs were? Or what do you think packs were? What do you think? Yeah. Boxes of ammunition. Yeah, it was ammunition packs. You're exactly right, Dylan. Good job. And so Giovanni Martin Martini was the last white man who lived to see George Armstrong Custer alive. As he rode away, as Martini rode away. It is believed that he was barely out of sight and the attack was going to be commencing. Well, he ran into Reno and Bantine and they didn't let him go back. And they didn't go to bring Custer the packs. They were too panicked and dug in here. So what we're going to have is we're going to have some of the Indians are going to stay here and harass Reno and Bantine. But the rest of the Indians are going to push the attack on Custer. Custer is going to ride down Medicine Tail Coulee because it's the place he thinks he can cross. And he's going to get down into here and all of a sudden Indians are going to come just flooding out of the village. And they're going to come up across the little bighorn and they're going to push the attack. And it doesn't take very long. It's not going to take very long. And Custer's going to go, go to high ground! Get back to high ground! And so Custer and his men are going to ride to the high ground. And what we're going to have is we're going to have Custer's battle taking place in two places with other men falling in places along the way. We're going to have men that are going to fall here. We're going to have men that are going to fall here. There's going to be two hills where the soldiers are going to kind of make a stand. The first one is right here. This is Calhoun Hill. The second one is the famous one that you guys know about. It's called Last Stand Hill. That's where Custer's going to fall. And Custer's men are going to be fighting. And as one of you said, they're going to shoot some of their horses for breastworks. And they're going to fall on this last stand hill. And the Indians are going to close in around them. And the Indians are going <coughs> to launch arrows into them. And the Indians are going to shoot at them. And the Indians are going to sneak up in the grass and pop up and fire. And we think that the final charge, possibly, by the Indians was led by none other than Crazy Horse, who would sweep over the hill and 
down into Custer's men, the last remnants of Custer's detachment. Custer and every man with him would die, including his brother, the heroic Tom Custer, two-time Medal of Honor winner in the Civil War. Boston Custer, his nephew, Audie Reed, would all die on this hill, Last Stand Hill. It sure does seem like a lonely, windswept place of prairie to die. The next day, Major Reno and Captain Benteen were going, where was Custer? Why didn't he ever come back? Because they had to stay here and they had to fight off the Indians. And they had wounded men. And they had to sneak to the river and get them water. But Reno and Benteen were able to hold off further Indian attacks. But they kept saying, where's Custer? Why doesn't he come and help? They couldn't figure out where Custer was. Well, there's a reason why Custer didn't come help, right? Custer was laid dead on this battlefield with the other 189 men or so that were with him. Custer had two wounds. He was shot in the chest, which we don't think was fatal. And the fatal shot was right to his forehead, right to the side of his temple. Only two wounds he had. The next day, General Alfred Terry came from the north and rode down. And they would discover the Custer battlefield. The soldiers had been stripped, in some cases mutilated, and so on. Remember, I told you how the sweltery heat was there? The bodies were bloated just bloated from the heat. It was a terrible, terrible scene. The Indians were fighting to protect their homeland. They were fighting to protect what they felt was theirs. The soldiers were obviously given the governmental orders to try to round them up, bring them into battle. The Indians had just won their biggest battle. But do you believe it's possible to win the battle, but lose the war. Yeah. It was the Indians' biggest moment of celebration. They had just won their biggest victory on the Northern Plains. But yet, this loss and the death of Custer and his men was going to be the beginning of the end for the Indians. Why do you think that was? Why was this a great victory for the Indians, yet it was only going to hasten their demise? What do you think? Logan. They killed Custer. they killed Custer, and they killed all these other men, and so the American people are going to scream for justice, right? And so what's the government going to do now? Dylan. Send even more forces. You got it. It's even going to strengthen their resolve to get the Indians of the Northern Plains onto the reservations and open this land up for white settlement and protect white settlers that are there. It's going to hasten their demise because we know that not long after the Battle of Big Horn, within a year, Crazy Horse is going to turn himself into Fort Robinson and eventually be killed. We know City Bowl is going to flee to Canada. Eventually return and go to the reservation. We know that after the Little Bighorn, it was a great victory in the moment for the Native Americans. But in the end, it would only hasten their defeat. And it's going to lead us to that final, final battle. Probably more accurately called a massacre. In 1890, a wounded knee, which you guys also researched, right? So tomorrow we're going to talk about that. When you guys research the Battle of Little Bighorn, did you see pictures of the battlefield? Did you find pictures of the battlefield online as you were looking? When you looked it up? I'm going to show you guys a picture of Last Stand Hill. You'll see the marker in the middle that has the bronze plaque on it. That was where George Armstrong Custer's body fell. That's where they discovered his body the next day. 
That right there, people, is Last Stand Hill. That's that windswept piece of prairie in southern Montana where the Custer legend in some ways it died, in some ways it only, in some ways it only grew bigger. This is from the south, or excuse me, from the uh, west, looking up to the east, to the top of Last Stand Hill. Here's Medicine Tail Coulee, where Custer was going to cross and attack the Indian village. Here's Reno Hill. Looking down into the valley. This is Reno Hill. Looking down into the valley where Reno had made his attack. Here you're going to get a real good look at the trees that Reno would end up retreating through. Here's Weir Point that I was telling you guys about, the highest point on the battlefield. The last place that Custer was able to look. Here's a real good look at the valley that Reno would attack in and be driven from. Questions on those pictures? Do they give you kind of an idea of what the battlefield looked like? You, you can see what the terrain was like, can't you? The hills, the grass, the valley, the river. How many of you here have been to Fort Abraham Lincoln, south of Mandan? You guys ever went there on a field trip when you were younger? To the Custer House? Brady's been there. Hopefully when you guys are older, I can take you there. It's where Custer left from to go out to this battle. Okay, go ahead and take out a piece of paper. Go ahead and number it. For right now, number one to five, we'll go ahead and take a quiz over what we talked about and how much of it you comprehended. 